Here is the question. What were the people of Gaza supposed to do? I'm going to give you a frank, personal admission, and I'm not proud of it, but I want to place this current situation in context. I first became involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict in June 1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon. I ended up writing my doctoral dissertation on a topic related to the Israel-Palestine conflict. And then I ended up devoting the whole of my adult life to that conflict. 40 years. And come 2020, even I gave up. I started to write about other subjects. I thought the situation was hopeless. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of guilt stirred up inside me because I realized I was abandoning a people trapped in a concentration camp. Now, I don't want to be emotive. I don't want to be dramatic. However, it behooves me to say both my parents were in concentration camps during World War II. My mother was in Maidana concentration camp. My father was in Auschwitz concentration camp. And I was riddled with guilt that people facing circumstances like my parents and I had abandoned them. So if even I had abandoned them, not making any claims to sainthood, but simply the fact that I invested 40 years of my life in that conflict, and finally had to resign myself to the fact that nothing could be done. So, does it really surprise you? Is it really a shock that a couple of days ago, the people of Gaza, most of whom, let's bear it in mind, most of whom were born in that concentration camp. Mm -hmm. They were born into it. Does it really shock you that they would do something desperate to break free of that concentration camp? Mm -hmm. And who dare criticize whatever tactics <clears throat> they employ? I am not approving it, but I am not disapproving it, mm. because I don't know what I would do if I had been born into a concentration camp and spent 20 years of my life there. Yeah. I've seen you in videos talk about what a lot of these IDF soldiers have done to these children, these kids. and taking out eyes and limbs and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> but I want to stay with Hamas for a second because I think this is important. Uh, because there's a lot of people right now, especially when it comes to our government, you know, our lawmakers, they immediately go to Hamas. They single out Hamas and they say Hamas is a bunch of terrorists, they're awful, and that somehow manufactures consent for the United States to supply Israel with as much weaponry as, they ha they, as we can and then for them to go after and <clears throat> with no compassion whatsoever, bomb buildings and schools and hospitals. I mean, I don't think we see a month go by without a Palestinian baby getting killed or shelled or shot. But I want to talk a little bit more about Hamas because there are there's a little bit more nuance to the situation. Now, first question I have is from what I said before you came on, right when we were introducing you, 
a lot of people are kind of framing this as Israel versus Hamas. I think Hamas was just one small faction of this, or maybe a big faction of this, but I would say this is Israel versus Palestine, that there are other groups that have joined with Hamas and whatnot because their backs are so against the wall that they have nothing to lose at this point. And, and, and I also said that this was inevitable, that this was bound to happen. I mean, it, it had to happen because, you know, like I said, their backs are completely against the wall. Uh, there's a, been a blockade going on there for quite some time. Israel has not stopped expanding their settlements. So for me, this was an inevitable that it was going to happen. So the first question is, number one, is it right to say it's just versus Hamas, or is it more of a bigger resistant coalition going on in Gaza and Palestine? And number two, we have this video here from Ron Paul. Uh, when Ron Paul mentioned on the floor of Congress that Hamas was actually started by Israel. I'm going to play this really quickly, and then we'll get your answers. What's happening in the Middle East, and in particular with Gaza right now, we have some moral responsibility for both sides, uh, in, in a way, because we provide help and funding uh, for both Arab nations and Israel. And uh, so we definitely have a moral responsibility, and especially now today, the weapons being used to uh, kill so many Palestinians are American weapons, and uh, American funds essentially are being used uh, for this. But there's a political liability, which I think is something that we fail to look at because too often there's so much blowback from our intervention in areas that we shouldn't be involved in. You know, Hamas, if you look at the history, you'll find out that Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel because they wanted Hamas to counteract Yasser Arafat. And you say, well, yeah, that was better then and served its purpose, but we didn't want Hamas to do this. So then we as Americans say, well, we have such a good system, we're going to impose this on the world. We're going to invade Iraq and teach people how to be Democrats. We want free elections. So we encourage Palestinians to have a free election. They do elect Hamas. So we first indirectly and directly through Israel help establish Hamas. Then we have election. Then Hamas is dominant, so we have to kill them. So it just doesn't make sense. During, during the 80s, uh, you know, we were allied with Osama bin Laden. And uh, we were contending with the Soviets. It was at that time our CAA was good. All right, we'll, we'll leave it at there, Professor Finkelstein. But the two questions. Number one, is this a war that now Israel has declared is directly against Hamas only? And second, with is it true also that you know Israel started Hamas as you know to push back against the PLO and Yazar Arafat? Can you give us a little insight to this these statements over here? It is factually correct what Ron Paul said that Israel encouraged in various ways for example, by not exerting as much repression on Hamas as it did on the PLO back in those years in order to create a counterweight to the PLO. I don't want to get involved in that history because to some extent, even though the point he made is historically valid, it's, if you don't mind my saying so, it's water under the bridge. No. It's, it's happened. So we're going to just accept it as a fact, though, as a historical point, he is correct. Let's talk about several things about Hamas. Bear in mind, as I continue, I do not defend Hamas. That's the responsibility of the Palestinian people to choose their leaders. If that economic blockade had not been imposed and Hamas failed in its leadership responsibilities, presumably it would have been voted out, Hamas would have been voted out in the next election. The democratic process was never allowed to the Palestinian people. Hillary Clinton, who was a senator at the time, 
when the elections occurred in Gaza, this was her response. I'm quoting her. We should have made sure that we did something to determine who was going to win. That's the American notion of democratic elections. We should rig them so the people will choose only the candidates that we want. Now, having said that, it is true because we do not in any way want to distort the historical record. The truth is on the side of the Palestinian people and the truth is on the side of the people of Gaza. It is true that up until the election of 2006, Hamas didn't recognize Israel as a state. However, once it came into power, it was undergoing an evolution which quite possibly, I'm not going to say certainly, it would quite possibly would have resulted in a leadership willing to negotiate with Israel. They were never given the chance. Now, you say, is it Hamas or is it the people of Gaza? I am not going to say they are one and the same. However, I will say that who fertilizes Hamas? Who foments the support for Hamas? Who are the young people who join Hamas? If they were given an opportunity in life, if they were given a chance, if they were able to breathe, I don't know if they would have joined Hamas. Most of these young people are at the point where they're willing to just sacrifice their life because the situation is so hopeless. So I can't separate Hamas from the people of Gaza because the blockade creates, the blockade creates a synthesis and assimilation between the people and Hamas. They have no other options. They have no other choices. And this is the question. This is the question that we must constantly ask ourselves. What were their options? Allow me, since you wanted me to fill in for your audience to look at the history. Now, periodically, periodically, Israel launches these brutal, merciless, criminal assaults on Gaza. There are so many of them that literally I can't remember all the names, but at least two might be familiar to your listeners. In 2007, Israel launched Operation Cast Lead. It went from December 26, 2008 to January 17, 2009. Amnesty International published a report on that, a large report on that assault. They called the report 22 days of death and destruction. Israel killed about 1,400 people, including 350 children. It demolished, it flattened 6,000 homes. Then I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip a the uh, three or four other assaults and go to 2014, Israel launches Operation Protective Edge. 
it kills 550 Palestinian children. It demolishes 18,000 homes. Peter Moore, he was the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross. He went to visit Gaza after those 51 days of death and destruction. And now I'm going to quote him. I hope your audience will bear in mind, we're talking about the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, which means he's seen many war zones. Indeed, his job is to visit war, war zones. <clears throat> and this is what he had to say after Israel's Operation Protective Edge. Quote, I've never seen such massive destruction ever before. I've never seen such massive destruction ever before. And who is this Destruction being visited upon this unprecedented destruction. Who is it being visited on? It's being visited on a population that's overwhelmingly refugees and which is half children. That's who the heroic IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, inflicts the most massive destruction that the president of the ICRC ever witnessed in his professional career. Yeah. Now, you might say, justifiably, you can talk about options. Well, why haven't the Palestinians tried nonviolence? <laughs> why haven't the people of Gaza tried nonviolence? But they did. In 2018, they launched the Great March of Return. And at the beginning, at the beginning, it was wholly nonviolent. What did Israel do? Well, there is a very good human rights support that was issued by the UN describing what Israel did. Does the audience want to know? I'll tell them. According to the report, Israel targeted medical personnel, targeted. It targeted journalists. It targeted people with physical disabilities. What were the snipers targeting? They were targeting kneecaps mm -hmm. and below. So, does it shock anyone? Is it really so bewildering that after attempting a nonviolent resistance, medical personnel were targeted? Journalists were targeted. People with disabilities were targeted. Is it really a shock that it deteriorated and ultimately failed in its goals, in its objectives, to end that brutal, inhuman blockade of Gaza? So, let's go back to the basic question. What were they supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Hey, come see us on tour. We're going to be in Dallas, Houston, San Diego, Bloomington, Illinois, Indianapolis, and Levittown, New York. Wow, that's a lot of dates. See you there.